So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the last week of the course on markets under critics. And today we'll have our final regular lecture by Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde. He is the Howard Marks Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also the director of the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. And he will present today on the future of markets. So <clears throat> go ahead, Professor. Thank you. So let me share my screen. So yes, so today I want to talk about a little bit the, the future of markets over the next uh, few decades and how we can use some of the lessons uh, from this um, course to think about them. And well, and the first thing I will need to motivate a little bit is why do we care about the future? And I always love this quote from Groucho Marx. Uh, why should I care about posterity? What has posterity ever done for me? So in particular, um, I want to think about the next three, four, five decades. And perhaps this will help us to, you know, think also a little bit about some of the key policies that one can uh, implement over the next uh, few decades. And of course, there is a famous quote. Um, it's a little bit unclear who said it for the first time. I check on the internet and it seems it was the famous Danish physicist Niels Bohr uh, that says it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And conditional that forecasting what will happen with uh, the world economy, which is a very complex, non-linear dynamic system, is extremely complicated. At least from my perspective, I think I see four main issues floating around. And the first one is demographics. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about how I think demographics will shape a lot of the future. Second one is climate change. The third one is geopolitical fragmentation. And the fourth one is artificial intelligence. Now, since we don't have a lot of time, uh, it's only one lecture, I will um, focus more on one and two. In fact, those are two areas where I have done research myself. So I think I can talk about them with a little bit more um, you know, knowledge. And I will maybe briefly mention the last two. Also, uh, I will skip a discussion of the intellectual forces. How is people thinking about markets right now? What are the latest trends in thinking? Uh, my view of the world has always been that trying to identify those intellectual forces in real time is very, very difficult. And that sometimes books that end up being tremendously influential 50 years later actually pass by uh, without a lot of attention in the short run and the other way around books that were bestsellers and that people thought that they would have a tremendous impact. Uh, in fact, 10 years later, uh, no one really remembers. And I'm already sufficiently old that I can tell you this is true, that you know, books that in the early 1990s, everyone thought were going to be very influential in the long run, uh, they were not. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to discuss, as I was mentioning before, is the demographic future of humanity. And this is a table that I use a lot of times because I think it makes a very important point. So you have probably seen thousands and thousands of articles, news reports, and books that make the following point. Let's look at GDP growth between 1991 and 2019. And people say, look, the US, the US has been doing great, 2.58, but Japan, has been stagnated, 0.83. So maybe Japan needs to do things in a different way. Maybe Japan needs to change monetary policy, which is one of the common arguments. Maybe Japan needs to change fiscal policy. Maybe Japan needs to do structural reforms. But something I have argued in uh, several papers is the following. One, notice this very simple thing, population of working age in the US has been growing nearly at a 1% a year, while population of working age in Japan has been falling a little bit more than 0.5% a year. That basically means that if you actually look at GDP per working age adult, actually Japan and the US have not been doing that differently. In fact, some of you may know 
that Japan didn't do very well in the early 1990s because it had a big real estate bubble and then a collapse. So if instead of doing from 1991, we will be looking from 1998 to today, the US and Japan have been growing exactly at the same speed in terms of GDP per working age adult. Why is this so important? Because the only reason working age population had been going down in Japan so much, but not in the US, is that Japan had a big drop in fertility earlier than all the other advanced economies. But this big drop in population is also going to hit any, sorry, every other major economy. For instance, if you actually think about this issue in a slightly different way, instead of thinking about GDP per working age adult, you think about total hours work and growth per total hours work, you see again that it turns out to be the case that Japan has not been doing worse than the US. The US has been growing at a 153%. Japan has been growing at a 1.26%. And again, if you take out the early years of the 1990s, then Japan and the US have been doing exactly the same. What is the big difference? The big difference is Japanese are working fewer hours. And why are Japanese working fewer hours? Because there are fewer of them and they are older and older people tend to work fewer hours. While in the US, people are working more hours. Why? Because they are more Americans and they are relatively young. So they have actually increased a little bit their labor supply. And as I was mentioning before, this is going to be, from my perspective, the future of most of the world over the next three or four decades. As I mentioned over there, the present of Japan is the future of the globe. And why is that the case? Well, a key factor in demographics is the so-called total fertility rate. The total fertility rate of a population is the average number of children that will be born to a woman over her lifetime if one, she were to experience the current age specific fertility rates throughout her lifetime. That is, if a 25 year old woman will now have the same number of children when she's 35 that the current 35 year old women are having, that's a little bit of an issue, but let's forget about it for a second. And two, if she were to live through ages 15, 24. Now, I will explain in a second that a simple interpretation of the total fertility rate is the number of children we will expect a woman to have on average. And you have probably heard already the number of 2.1, although I will try to convince you that this 2.1 is a little bit more subtle than it seems. Okay? I will come back to that in the very next slide. But basically, demographers argue that fertility of 2.1 means that population is going to be constant in the long run. If you are below 2.1, the population is not replacing itself. If fertility is above 2.1, the population is expanding. Now, Japan had a fertility that dropped below 2.1 in 1974. It was the first major industrialized economy that achieved that level. Now, at the moment, I remember the early 1980s or late 19, 19, uh, 1980s, people thought that Japan was really exceptional, that maybe other countries in Northern Europe could be a little bit in a similar situation, but this was not really anything that we should worry too much about. Well, it turns out to be the case that Japan's fertility has continued going down and now it's at 1.2, 1.2. So that means on average, every Japanese woman is having 1.2 children, but this is not just only Japan. Contrary to what we thought, this has extended and spread all across the planet, including in countries that you will have not suspected. Look, Iran. And the reason I pick Iran is because it's an economy that actually doesn't have very high income and it comes from a cultural area where people tend to believe the Middle East that fertility is relatively high. And yet, Iran is well below replacement rate. Think about the US. 
The U.S. was interesting because for a long time, it was the only rich advanced economy that kept fertility relatively high, but that changed around 2008. And now the U.S. fertility rate is 1.6 and falling. Look at Brazil, 1.44 and falling very fast. Even if you don't believe it, the U.S. now has a higher fertility rate than Brazil. China, 1.07 even lower than Japan, despite the fact that China is still much poorer than Japan, and South Korea in the quite amazing 0.72. Just to give you an idea of how low a fertility of 0.72 is, imagine that you have a high school class with 100 people. And it's a very peculiar high school class because you are going to have 50 girls and 50 boys, and each of them we are going to marry each from the first group is going to become a partner of someone from the second group. And they are going to, we are going to look at what happens with them in terms of reproduction. Of course, this is just a summary of what it means, the average Korean. Well, that basically means that there are 50 women, they will have 0.72 kids on average, each of them. So we are going to be talking about 37 children. So the high school class of 100 will only have 37 descendants. That gives you an idea of the demographic tsunami that is hitting South Korea already. Okay, And like this, I could go countries after country. I have not tried to be cute and select a few countries that are very, very low, total, that have very low, very low fertility rates. I have just selected countries where this fertility rate, I thought they were representative of what's going on. I mentioned before that I was trying to motivate why the total fertility rate was an important statistic to look at. And the reason is because we have something called the replacement rate, which is the rate of fertility at which there are enough children being born to sustain population growth. Sorry, current population levels. And this is, of course, forgetting net immigration. Things change a little bit. If you have immigrants, I can come back to that in a second. Now, a very simple formula. This is a simplification. The exact formula is a little bit more complicated, but you don't need to worry about that. Is that the replacement rate in a population is equal to one plus the sex ratio at birth. That is how many boys are being born for every girl divided by the probability of a woman to survive to 30. So how do you think about this? Well, this is very simple. In a population with any type of outside intervention, that is, we don't have any type of selective abortions, we don't have any type of genetic testing, etc. on average, there are 1.05 boys born for every girl, okay? And you know, there are probably good evolutionary reasons for that because boys tend to um, die more than girls. So as a population, we probably want to have a, sur a surplus of boys, okay? So that basically says that if you have one woman, she's going to have, let's suppose that she has 1.05 children, sorry, 1.05 boys and one girl. And that will be, 2.05, and that will ensure that one woman has another woman coming be uh, behind her, and then the change can go on. That's the numerator over here, one plus the sex ratio at birth. But why do we do this probability of a woman to survive to 30? Because this chain I was telling you of one woman having one girl implies that this one girl can move on and reproduce herself. So we need to control for the fact that she may not reach fertility age. Now, in principle, we will need to look at her whole probability survival over her whole uh, fertile cycle. But in practice, since the fertile cycle is between around 14 years old to around 45, we just take the middle point, which is 30. And that's why this is an approximation, okay? And it turns out to be the case that in a, Society like the US right now, around 98% of girls being born make it to 30 years old. And that's why 
you take one plus 1.05, you divide by 0.98 and you have 2.1. Okay, and the interpretation of 2.1 is we need that every woman has 2.1 boys, uh, uh, births on average, because 1.07 will be boys, 1.03 will be girls, or well, let me do it like this. 1.08 will be boys, 1.01.02 will be girls, and of this 1.02, one will move on to reproduce. And again, we will be back over here. Now, this is why you hear 2.1 on the news a lot of times. Oh, the fertility, the replacement rate is 2.1. Well, turns out to be the case that this very simple idea is actually not right when we are thinking about the planet as a whole. In particular, in many developing countries, we have selective abortions. Let me give you a very simple example, China and India. And these are big countries from a demographic perspective. China has 115 boys for every 100 girls being born and India around 110. And other countries that are relatively large like Vietnam, 111. On the other hand, if you go to the Americas, in all the Americas, you are just at 1.05 which is exactly what you will expect in countries under natural, uh, under natural uh, conditions. In Europe, you know, you have a few deviations, but you know, usually they are like 1.06, which you know, can be explained by maybe a small genetic variations. That means that you don't want to put over here in the formula 1.05, you may want to put 1.1. Because as I was telling you before, you have China, you have India, which are at a much higher level, and they wait a lot in the world population. Moreover, female mortality rates are much higher. In an average sub-Saharan country, you may encounter that only 80% of women actually reach to the age of uh, 30. Well, not on the average, but on some of the poorest, you actually get that. And when you get these two things together, what you get is actually the replacement rate for a developing country can be 2.6. And in some of the worst cases like Niger or uh, Mali, it may be as high as three, okay? So remember 2.1 is not really a fix in a stone value. It's a replacement rate that makes sense for rich countries, but it doesn't make sense for a lot of Africa and Asia. So when I put all this together, in my calculations, I get that the world sex birth at ratio is 1.07, a little bit higher than the 1.05 because of China, India, and other uh, Asian countries. And the survival is 0.91 for women. And that gives you that the world replacement rate is around 2.25. Now, if you go to the United Nations World Population Prospects 2022, the world total fertility rate is 2.3. And you start seeing that these two numbers look very similar. But it's actually even more than that. Why? Because the United Nations World Population Prospects overestimate big time the total fertility rate. For example, it forecasted that in 2023, there will be 10.6 million birds in China, when in fact, there were only 9 million birds, okay? And what I have done with some co-authors is if we have gone over all the countries where we could find data for birds in 2022 or 2023, we have compared it with what the United Nations was forecasting. And what we are seeing is that in general, the United Nations is over forecasting, that is, is forecasting more birds by between 10 to 20%, okay? It's not the case for every country, but it's the case for the average country. That means that the world fertility rate is 2.1 to 2.2. But I just told you that the world fertility replacement rate is 2.25. Thus, most likely, the wall is already below the replacement rate, okay? I'm not, look at this, I'm not saying the rich economies, I'm not saying the Western wall, 
I'm not even saying Asia, Europe, and the Americas. No, no, no. The whole planet is already below the replacement rate. And you will see how the United Nations is going to publish a new population prospect this summer. And I'm happy to bet with you that they are going to lower substantially the number of birds forecasted because they have been missing big time. Now, you are going to ask, if the wall is already below the replacement rate, why is the population, the world population is still growing? Well, because of something called momentum effect. Basically, the momentum effect means that if you had very, very large previous or older cohorts, even if these cohorts are still not reproducing according to the replacement rate, you can still have increases in the population in the short run. And also because you have increases in life expectancy. So let me give you an example. Imagine that we have two grandparents, grandparent one and, grand and grandparent two, and they have four children. We call them A, B, C, and D. So that generation, the fertility rate was for well above replacement rate. But each of these kids is only having one son. Okay. Of course, each of these four partner with another four for, you know, let's suppose again, coming back to just an example from another family that also had two grandparents. So they are like four girls, four sisters, marrying four brothers. Okay. A very peculiar situation, but you know, it makes the point that I'm trying to say. You are basically going to have four grandparents eight children and only eight grandchildren. Very clearly, the population is not replacing itself, but, sorry, I'm four grandchildren because uh, each of them are, are marrying. Okay? So it's four, eight, four. But while the grandparents are still alive, the population has grown. While the parents are still alive, the population has grown. But once the grandparents and the parents pass away, you will see the big decrease in population. So it takes a little bit of time between falling below the replacement level and start having a decrease in population. Coming back to the example of Japan, Japan fall below the replacement rate in 1974, but population only started going down, forgetting about immigration in the late 1990s. It takes between 20 to 25 years for this to happen. And this is what is known as momentum. Okay. So if you go and you look at the momentum of the world population, a way to think about the momentum is to compare the birth rate versus the death rate. The birth rate is just the number of children being born per 1,000 population. This is not fertility. Fertility is the number of children per woman. This is the number of births per 1,000 population. And what you can see is that the number of births in the, in the world has been decreasing in a dramatic way and now we are around 16 per thousand. While death, death rate has also been going down, even if the population is aging because of increases in life expectancy. And now we are around nine per thousand. But what is going to happen is as the population ages, this is going to start increasing, not because we live shorter, but just because we have older and older populations. This is very simple. Just look at the death rates in countries in Western Europe or in Japan or, or in the United States, they start going up. And then this birth rate is going to start going down and it's going to cross in some moment. And when is that going to happen? Well, you know, there is some uncertainty about the future. But according to the United Nations, this will happen in 2086. Now, I don't believe that. Okay. They will say that we are 8 billion right now. They say that this will happen around 10.43 billion in 2026, uh, 2086. I already told you that I disagree. I actually see the peak of the population at a much lower level around 2055. 
with around 9.7 billion. Okay. And why the difference between my projections and the one from the United Nations? Well, because the United Nations is being very, very cautious in their assumptions about the fall in fertility. I already told you that China had in 2023 1.6 million births less than what the United Nations was forecasting. That was actually why they forecasted for 2050. But let me give you another example. Egypt already had in 2023 less births that the United Nations was forecasting in 2100. That is, Egypt is 78 years ahead of what the United Nations was forecasting. Okay, And in addition to it, the United Nations is assuming a partial recovery of fertility in low fertility countries like South Korea and Japan. And the fact is we have never seen this happening. It may happen, but we haven't seen it. Okay. Why the United Nations are doing this? I think they invested so much time and effort talking about the population bomb during the 1960s and 1970s that now they feel a little bit bad saying that the problem of humanity is not that population is growing, that the population may start going down. And I also think it's because the change in fertility over the last 10 years has been very, very fast and the United Nations wants to see a little bit more data points before changing their forecast very dramatically. But I have tried to argue very vehemently that fertility is falling much faster than anyone had anticipated. So I want to make this very clear. All demographers 10, 20 years ago forecasted that fertility was going to go down very fast. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that fertility is falling down faster that even those who thought it was going to fall fast have anticipated. And well, why is this going to be very important? Because first of all, we are going to have very, very quick changes in population sizes, okay? And this is going to have a lot of consequences that are going to be a little bit good and some consequences that may be quite bad. And which one will predominate will depend a little bit on what type of policy responses we offer. Now, let me be very clear about this. We are really venturing in terra incognita, okay? We have never been, no human has ever lived in a society like South Korea today with a fertility of 0.7. And by the way, now fertility is still going down. We already have data for South Korea for January of 2024, and fertility continues going down. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. And number of births continue going down. Okay? And, and we can be wrong. Okay? Uh, you know, maybe in 10 years, people decide to have kids again like crazy. Who knows? Uh, if you pick any social sciences textbook from the 1980s or even the 1990s, as I was mentioning before, the main concern was the population explosion. And when I was a kid, I remember my parents bought me a book that impressed me a lot because it talked about Mauritius, that very beautiful island in the uh, Indic Ocean. And the book basically said, well, you know, it's a pity uh, that Mauritius is so pretty because the population in the island is so out of control that Mauritius is doomed. Mauritius, they are going to die. All of them are going to die of starvation. And I thought, wow, that's, that's such a... That's such a bad negative prospect. But actually, population did not explode in Mauritius. Fertility went down dramatically. And Mauritius has already had negative population growth over the last couple of years, and it's most likely going to lose a lot of population. So um, there is a non-trivial risk that someone may make fun of me in 25 years. You know, this video may still exist in 25 years, and people will say, hey, Jesus, he got this completely, this completely wrong. And, you know, a couple of examples of people getting absolutely everything wrong. There was a professor at Stanford, he's still alive, called Paul El Elrit, and he brought this book, uh, The Population Bo uh, Bomb, Population Control or Race to Oblivion. Well, he basically said that, you know, we were doomed, that there was pretty much nothing we could really do, that population was going to become so, uh, so big that we were going to starve to death. 
And uh, it's actually, I, I reread the book last summer and, and it's quite funny. The book was very bad. And, and even from the data set that he had at the time, he, he really didn't understand demographics. It's, uh, but on the other hand, you know, coming back to my point before, this book was a bestseller. He was at the top list at the New York Times. If you were anyone who was so-called quote-unquote expert or well-read person, what Ehrlich was saying was absolutely uh, right and, and he was completely wrong. You could not be more wrong than that. And then there is this other book that perhaps people remember a little bit le less, Famine 1975, American Decision, Who Will Survive? And the argument of William and Paul Paddock was that by 1975, the world will run out of food and uh, the only country with will still have a little bit of a surplus will be the United States and that uh, the United States will need to decide uh, which country to, um, to save. And uh, for instance, uh, they say, look, uh, India in particular, yeah, let's write them off. They they are not doing anything serious about population control and, and India is going to starve to death and the US should not waste money and effort trying to save India. And the interesting thing is that if you look at 2023, actually India not only can feed all its population, it's a big exporter of uh, food. So, you know, you can get these things completely wrong. So having said that, let me go and try to think a little bit about some of these um, outcomes. So the first thing that I want to highlight is the uh, good news. And, um, you know, the good news that everyone uh, mentions always or points out is that with a lower population growth, there are things like designing policies to ensure the sustainability of natural resources that are just going to be easier to handle. If instead of growing very, very fast, your population is not growing very fast or is even falling a little bit, then it's much easier to uh, upgrade or improve your infrastructure. It's much easier to handle your housing. It's much easier to handle emissions, etc. And what we can do is go back and redesign many of the Latin American cities. And this is a photograph that I use a lot of times in a lot of different courses. It's in Brazil. And you can see one side of Brazil, very poor, with really, really lousy housing. The other side with this beautiful condo building with a beautiful swimming pool and these jacuzzis in every terrace. And maybe we can, you know, part of the consequences of this very unequal, uh, sorry, reasons for this very unequal situation of uh, Brazil and many other Latin American countries was the big population growth during the 20th century. Now that population is going to be uh, under uh, uh, much easier to handle uh, parameters may we can go and we can you know really transform this area into something that looks much better and we are in a much uh, better shape okay so there are good things that are ahead of us and um, in particular before population aging really kicks in many developing countries are going to have what you can call extra fiscal space and in this extra fiscal space because you are not spending so much money on education you are not spending so much money on housing and infrastructure you can uh, take advantage of lower fertility and undertake essential reforms. So you know, there are good things about a lower fertility and a lower population growth, and we need to acknowledge them. But on the other hand, there are also bad news. And the bad news are exactly the table that I used to motivate this lecture at the beginning when I was comparing the US with uh, Japan. And a basic identity in economics, and again, this is an identity, is that output is equal to labor productivity times hours work. That is, you know, how much we produce is how many hours we produce times how much we produce by hour, okay? Nothing very deep over there. Now, if you take logs and derivatives with respect to time on both sides of this equation, you get that output growth is labor productivity growth plus the growth of hours. And even, if labor productivity growth stays at the same speed that we had before, labor growth will not be at the same level that in the past. In fact, it can be negative. So the way I always present this to try to explain this is think about your quote-unquote average advanced economy around 1965. Okay? In the middle of the so-called 30 glorious years of post-war World War II, uh, post, uh, World War II economic growth. And what you have is that you have an output growth of 3%. You know, that was Germany, was France, was the United States. Why? Because you were having a 2% labor productivity growth per year, 
plus a 1% growth of labor, okay, of hours work or workers. And that meant that when the economy was booming, because, I don't know, maybe there was expansionary fiscal policy, so you had good shocks, unemployment was falling, labor was growing, etc., you could see that the economy was growing at a 4%. And when the economy was depressed, and labor growth was um, uh, growing not faster, but more slowly, sorry, that's a typo, more slowly than on average, the economy will grow at around a 2%. But what is the situation now? If you're in a situation like Japan, where the hours work may be falling at a 1%, even if you can still get a 2% labor productivity growth, you are going to get an output growth of 1% at most. Okay? And when the economy is booming and unemployment is falling, then you may get to 2%. When the economy is depressed and you are doing a little bit worse, you'll grow at a 0%. And the point over here to understand is that there is nothing whatsoever that a central bank can do with, uh, with further monetary stimulus or the fiscal authority. Labor productivity is still 2%. Okay. And you know, that's actually a positive assumption, an optimistic assumption, because I'm basically thinking that there is not going to be any effect of the change of population growth and productivity. It's just that there is going to be less fewer workers. Okay? And as we saw above, in fact, Japan has been doing pretty well in terms of output per worker growth during the last 25 years. And this is exactly what is the future for the US. This is the civilian labor force growth rate. It peaked in the 1970s where a lot of women were joining the labor force. And you can see a very, very big fast drop as fertility has dropped in the US and actually immigration, well, not over the last three years, but immigration has a downward trend. And you can see this in different ways, but let me skip it. Now, at this moment, I always get someone who asks, but hey, what do I care if total output grows more slowly? Because what I care about is output per capita. And my answer is yes and no. Yes, on one hand, uh, we care about output per capita as the primary measure of individual uh, welfare. But there are many other things like our ability to service debt and social security obligations that depend on total output. So this is very important. If we are thinking about, so again, let me get these uh, things. And by the way, I'm, I'm using the US now as an example, but you know this will be the same for any other country in the world, okay? If we are thinking that the US is having, let's say 100%, 120% debt over GDP, you are saying, well, you know, this may not be a big deal because we are going to be growing at a 3%. And you know, what is today 120% over total GDP? If GDP is growing at a 3%, it's something we can afford. But if GDP is going to, growth is going to go down to 1%, suddenly is not something that we are going to be able to afford any longer, okay? So there is really a tremendous change in the future of our total GDP, and this is going to have a large consequences for our ability to meet our fiscal goals. And moreover, something that I'm going to, you know, I have been also emphasizing a lot, is there is going to be some sense of gloom or stagnation in the economy and an economy that just grows 1% a year. There's not going to be a lot of space for new firms. There is not going to be a lot of space for new technologies just because the total economy is not growing a lot. Okay, That means that, in fact, it is very unlikely that labor productivity will continue growing at a 2% when population is shrinking. And if we had a little bit more time, I could show you some evidence that this is in fact probably the case. And in that sense, things are a little bit gloomier than my forecast before. Okay, let me skip all this. Okay, this will probably mean that we are going to live in a world of very low output growth, that we are going to live in a world of low real interest rates, that we are going to have a very complex fiscal position of most governments that we are going to have the population of certain regions. This is going to be mainly concentrated in the rural areas. 
this is going to have huge effects on real estate prices, and this is going to have huge effects on education services, health services, and other public services. We already seen in the US that some private colleges are closing. There is one very close to where I live, Cabrini University, that just had to close because there are not that many kids anymore. And this is going to accelerate dramatically. Over the next 20 years, we are going to see tons of colleges and universities in the US in a very difficult financial situation just because fertility has gone down so far, so much and so fast. Okay. And this is going to really put a lot of pressure on the political system. And there is going to be a lot of unhappiness. There is going to be a lot of polarization. But at the end of the day, this just comes from lower output growth because you have lower population growth. At this moment, I always have someone saying, oh, but artificial intelligence is going to fix this. I may say a few things after that. Yeah, artificial intelligence may help a little bit with this 2%. So instead of growing at a 2%, maybe thanks to artificial intelligence, we can grow 2.5%, but that's not going to change as a first order anything. First of all, because we have never seen a technology that has increased labor productivity so much. And second, because a lot of the things I'm saying has nothing to do with issues like population growth, sorry, with uh, labor productivity growth. If there are no children, you cannot have a university, period. You cannot have a hospital, period. And the fact that you have artificial intelligence will not change any of that. Anyway, let me quickly stop here my statements about um, uh, demographics. Uh, and I really, really want to emphasize we're in a whole new world. I don't think that people really appreciate and understand the effect that the drop in fertility worldwide is going to have on the world economy and the future of markets over the next 50 years. In the interest of time, I have skipped tons of other aspects. Uh, but as a matter of fact, to a large extent, you know, there is this old saying that demography is destiny. And, you know, changing slightly the quote by Bob Lucas about economic growth, once we start thinking about demographics, it's hard to think about anything else. That's why I wanted to spend the first, you know, 45 minutes of today's lecture on this issue. Okay, very good. Second issue that is going to shape a lot the world economy over the next 50 years or so, maybe 40 years, is climate change. Okay, and in fact, if you ask uh, a lot of policymakers, they will tell you that this is the number one policy challenge that the world faces. I actually do not agree with that, but nonetheless, let's go back to it. So before getting into the discussion, I think it's good to set up some basic summary of what the consensus is from climate scientists. And I'm going to copy this from Hassler and his co-authors on a very recent working paper on the economics of climate change. The first thing that we know is that you set up a very simple system of five different equations. And this system describes the relation between emissions of CO2 and global warming quite well. And it does it both qualitatively and quantitatively. And in fact, if you go back and look at the forecast in the early 1980s of how the climate of the planet was going to evolve, given these five different equations and feeding in the observed emissions of CO2, you actually do surprisingly well. On a day-to-day -day life, I do time series econometrics and believe me, uh, how well these equations fit the data is actually quite surprising. This system of, equation, basic system of equations basically tells us that global warming is approximately proportional to the cumulative emissions of CO2, okay? both in the short and in the long run. So the more CO2 you emit and it's cumulative, that is the whole stock of what you have emitted over the years, predicts very, very well global warming. And it's not only that you have higher temperatures, what is really key is that the frequency and intensity of weather extremes, like big droughts, heat waves, et cetera, increases with the global mean temperature. So it's not 
that we care that much about the mean temperature, even if we care about the mean temperature, is that we really care about weather extremes. Okay, how many days we are going to have in Philadelphia in 2050, where the temperature out there is more than 100 degrees, and that's when things become really, really binding. Now, this is much, this is basically about science, climate science. We are going to take that as given. What I can tell you now as an economist, because this is something we can go and measure is that global CO2 emissions are not falling, but they are increasing at a lower rate than two decades ago. I'm going to show you a graph in just one second. Okay, And both in the European Union and in the United States, in fact, emissions have gone down. And they have gone down both if we measure in terms of what we produce in the US, but also in what we consume. Sometimes when I explain this, people say, oh no, but the reason why it have gone down in the US is because now we import a lot of our stuff from China. So the CO2 is emitted in China. No, even if we look at the CO2 emissions of the goods consumed in the US, they have been going down actually quite a bit. Okay. Now, on the other hand, you have the complete opposite situation in China and India. And you will see in a second that really the main driver at this moment of global CO2 emissions is China. And finally, the last point I want to highlight is that the amount of fossil fuel left on the ground, basically oil, natural gas, and coal, is huge if we think about if we burn it, we get it out and we burn it, and we want to keep the climate between the 1.5 Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius global warming, that the Treaty of Paris has set up as a target, okay? And in fact, even if we were just look at the amount of oil and gas, so forget about coal, only focus on oil and gas, and only focus on the gas and oil with very low extraction cost, basically what you have in Saudi Arabia that you can pump up at a very, very low cost, is roughly of the same order of magnitude as the carbon budgets, that is how much we can emit in terms of CO2 before we reach these targets. Okay, So that basically says that, look, if you want to keep the climate between 1.5 and 2 Celsius degrees, and you don't want to have too many weather extremes, we use, we really cannot use all, all the oil and gas that we have on the ground. Okay, And that will be a real problem. Very good. So how do economists think about this? And how do economists think about the type of policy interventions that you can undertake, well, we basically think about those through something that we call an integrated assessment model. And an integrated assessment model will look at how the economy and the climate interact quantitatively. We write a model of the economy. We look how this model of the economy has CO2 emissions that affect the climate. The climate changes in the climate has some damages, and these damages feed back into the economy. And we write these models, and basically we try to learn about them to do three different types of things. And that's the type of things I'm going to tell you in just one second and help us to think about the future of the world economy. The first one is positive analysis. I know that from previous lectures, you already learned the difference between positive and normative analysis. So in positive analysis, we are just going to look at future paths of variables of interest. In terms of normative analysis, we can design optimal policies, and that's what I want to spend some time. And we can also think about counterfactuals, like what will happen if we have some type of mitigation efforts and we will have some changes in technology. Now, interestingly, the IPCC, the World Organization that is looking at climate change, it doesn't have an integrated assessment model. It used to have one back in the 1990s, and then they drop it. And in general, its economic analysis is in general pretty bad. And this is a little bit disappointing that, uh, you know, let me be very honest, around 90% of things you are going to read on the media about climate change and the economy are, be, I would say, more or less either awful or truly awful. Okay, so let's, let's be clear about that. Okay, so let me give you an example of how you know, good economists actually think about these integrated assessment models and how we can learn from them. So one of my favorite papers in this field is by Juan Cruz and Esteban Rosenhansberg. It just came out in 2023. And what they do is they build one of these integrated assessment models of the world economy. 
And what they compute is that the average welfare loss from this climate change that is anticipated given the current level of emissions is around 6%. And that's a lot. To give you an idea, economists, macroeconomists tend to think that the average welfare loss of business cycle fluctuations is perhaps 0.7, 0.6%. So this is 10 times as costly as the business cycle. On the other hand, 6% is not the end of the world, okay? So, you know, when when I see people, you know, demonstrate in the streets saying this is, you know, doomsday and judgment day, that's not true either. We are going to lose, this is not going to be pretty, but it's not going to be the end of the planet. Now, what Kruz and Rosin Hasberg highlight is that there is going to be a very large heterogeneity in climate damages across space. Some places are actually going to win and some places are going to lose and some places are going to lose a lot and some places actually can gain quite a bit. And for instance, just let me show you a map of the world copied from their paper. And what they show is that parts in the north of the United States and in Canada and parts in the north of Europe are actually going to gain. And that makes a lot of sense. I spent five years of my life in Minneapolis. Certainly that Minneapolis is a little bit warmer in the winter will more than compensate the losses from Minneapolis being a little bit warmer, uh, uh, warmer in the summer. However, you are going to have big changes, negative changes in Southeast Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in much of Latin America. And that's the problem that we are facing, okay? There are going to be large welfare losses, but those welfare losses are very heterogeneous. And unfortunately, most of those who are going to have large welfare losses are actually people who are relatively poor. This is a regression of the log real GDP per capita against the welfare losses. And you can see that in fact, if you are very, very rich, you are a country who are going to lose a little bit, but if you are poor, you are going to lose a lot. And that's not good. Okay, it's not good for any sense of, you know, distributional aspects. Okay, well, why, let me skip this. Why is this important? Precisely because of the, uh, of the graph that I'm going to show you in a moment. I mentioned before that the Paris Agreement of 2015 tries to limit global warming to well below two degrees. So how are we doing so far? So to me, this is graph, which I'm taking from the, AMI, from the IMF, makes the point very, very clearly. These are the global greenhouse gases emissions, which is not only CO2, it's also things like methane, but don't worry too much about those differences. You can very clearly see the point I was making before, that these things are increasing very fast. Until more or less 2015, where they have stabilized. But since what matters is the cumulative over time, if we want to keep the 1.5 goal or even the two degrees goal, we need to reduce a lot. And we need to reduce to this level by 2050. But now, what is the problem? Well, look at what the European Union is emitting. It's not that much. The European Union has actually been going down quite a bit. So even if the European Union reduces its emissions by 80% or even 100%, doesn't make that much of a difference. The same can be said about the US. Even if the US reduces emissions dramatically 50%, it makes a bit of a difference, but not that much. This is what makes a difference. Change. And moderation. Okay. India also a little bit. So if we are going to get here, yes, something can be done in the United States, something can be done in Europe, but the real big, big thing needs to be done in Asia. And what is the problem? The problem is, as I just told you before, that uh, you know some people are going to be winning, some people are going to be losing, and the ones who are need to pay and the ones who need to win can be actually quite different. This Oops, I skipped that. Oh, let me jump directly here. This will be a little bit, imagine that we were going to make a transfer system that will say who needs to pay for this and who needs to receive transfer from this. The European Union will need to pay a little bit 
The US will need to pay a little bit more, but the one who will really, really need to pay is China. And who will be the countries that will gain a lot? Will be Africa, will be India, because India is still emitting quite a bit, but not that much. And there is a lot of Indians and other less lower income countries. So the problem basically over here, coming back to this graph, is these guys are going to suffer a lot from climate change. They are not really making that many emissions. These guys are emitting a lot and they don't care that much about it. And how do you square this cycle? Okay. So the problem is basically that we have very large transaction cost. Okay. If we want to really reduce emissions and go to the level that we need, we need to pay from, for that transition. And I just told you that that transition is very costly. Now, I don't know how many of you likes The Simpsons, but the, there is this famous episode where this is the comic uh, shop guy. And uh, the episode is where he talks about the worst episode ever to make a joke about you know critics of The Simpsons episodes. So something I have called the worst economic argument ever. And the worst economic argument ever produced by a human mind is the decarbonization of the world economy is great because it will create many green jobs, green investments, blah, 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 blah. Why is this the worst economic argument ever? Because every job, quote unquote, created or investment required is actually a net cost for society. It's not a benefit. Okay? Jobs are not in a, a scar resource over there. If we learn something about markets from history is that there are enough jobs for everyone who wants a job all the time. Yeah, you may have a little bit of a recession and maybe aggregate demand is not where it's supposed to be, but those things are temporary. Jobs are a cost to society, not a benefit. And the way I always illustrate it is as follows. Imagine that we come up with two new technologies. Which one will you choose? Technology one is a technology that will generate all the energy that the planet needs at net zero emissions and the investment cost of $1. And it only requires one worker to operate. It's a pretty cool technology, okay? With $1, I volunteer. I will pay that $1 myself, okay? And all it requires one worker to operate. So, you know, even if we pay this worker $100,000, we will generate all the electricity that we need in the planet close to zero. Or think about a net zero technology that will generate all the tech, all the energy we need on earth with an investment cost of $1 trillion and that requires 10 million workers to operate. Well, very obviously, this quote unquote creates 10 million jobs, creates a lot of investment opportunities. You don't want to do two, you always want to do one, okay? So more in general, no, decarbonization will not increase economic growth. We are transitioning to a new technology that is more costly. Let's be honest with the public. And let's try to explain to them, we may need to do this because of climate change, but this is not an opportunity, okay? It is not, it's a cost, okay? So I was mentioning before, beyond this large adjustment cost, there are the redistributional effects I was mentioning before, the fact that we will need to reallocate production across the state, across the space and across sections. There is the large free riders problem. Basically, if you go over here and you say, look, I'm part of the other Americas. I'm not going to do much because, you know, no matter what I do, this will not reduce much my, my emissions. Let China and the United States take care of it. Well, if everyone thinks in that way, it's the standard free rider problem, the tragedy of the commons that I think that Jacob explained to you, people will not do it. There is also some other issues that I'm not going to get over here, like the limited fiscal space that governments have right now, the geopolitical fragmentation, higher interest rates, why this matters? Well, because you know, if we are going to keep having, well, at least for the next few years, the high interest rates we are have right now, a lot of the investments we need to uh, make will be financed at a higher cost, and that's a little bit of a problem, okay? So basically, the point that I'm trying to make 
is if we want to make to get over here, this is going to be costly and it's not obvious how we are going to share that cost and who will pay for it. On the other hand, there are also good news. And the good news is that human ingenuity plus the power of incentives is extremely powerful. Okay? And we have seen that in history again and again. In fact, as I was saying before with respect to fertility, Technology here has progressed faster than everyone expected. Everyone thought technology was going to evolve very fast, but it has evolved even faster. In particular, there is something called the levelized cost of energy, LCOE, which is kind of a lifetime uh, cost of producing electricity or energy from some type of um, new technology. And you really take care of, you know, Every all the costs from you start, you know, and breaking ground until you decommission the plant. And that takes account that different technologies have different expenses over the life cycle. Anyway, so if you do a state-of-the-art utility range solar, okay, so I'm not talking about putting some solar panels on your roof, I'm talking about a utility range solar farm in Arizona. The LCOE is probably around 24 megawatts hour, which is actually cheaper than any other alternative. So even if you don't care at all about climate change, the fact is that solar now is cheaper than anything else. And not only is cheaper, but we are also at a level that we are getting close to things that will be very interesting. So when this else, sorry, I, that's not what I wanted to do. Go over here. When the LOCO goes to below ten dollars megawatt hour, it's kind of a magic threshold because, for instance, producing synthetic gas and synthetic fuels will be cheaper than pumping them from the ground. So, what is synthetic fuels? I basically go to the atmosphere. I get some carbon and get some hydrogen and I use electricity to make a hydrocarbon. I put this in a engine, it burns and it generates carbon, but because this is the same that I put is net zero emission and the hydrogen just, you know, goes back to the air. And by the way, we know this technology since early 20th century. Believe it or not, the Germans during World War II ran most of their uh, military machinery. Uh, their army, especially after 1944, pretty much everything was with synthetic fuels. Is that it was very costly. So these days, it takes around four times the cost of synthetic fuel. It's around four times the cost of getting it from the ground. But the day, since this requires electricity, the day that we are around 10, megawatt hours, this will go from four to around 0.9, okay? And then basically you have fixed the problem of climate change because you can just use any type of fuel that you want, synthetic fuel. You can use solar, for instance, to generate the electricity you need for this. You can generate synthetic gas. You can produce hydrogen to operate uh, utilities as backups when there is no solar. So the problem of uh, irregular solar and wind gets completely uh, fixed. And in addition to it, you can do carbon capture relatively cheap. So you get CO2 from the atmosphere, you pump it deep into earth, which is what it was before we pump it out in the form of fossil uh, fuels and burn it. And you can re uh, redo the atmosphere of the planet. You can rebuild it. Okay. So at a very, very fundamental technological level, climate change has been fixed, okay? If there was no political implementation problem, climate change is something that can be fixed in 10 years. That's why the way, why I was saying before, I think the issues of fertility are much more important in the long run for humanity than the issues of climate change, because climate change has been, at a technological level, it has been fixed. Now, the problem, and a good example of this, is from the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has the same amount of CO2 emissions in 2017 that in 1890, 
This has been going down very, very fast. So probably the United Kingdom by now is around here, is emitting less CO2 than in the early 19th century. Okay. And even the UK has you know, made a lot of progress. It's not that they have gone completely crazy in type of things. And as soon as the United Kingdom decarbonizes its uh, car fleet, and it gets to, uh, you can see that now most of what they use is uh, oil. As soon as the United Kingdom decarbonizes its, elect, uh, uh, its, its car fleet, the United Kingdom will be where it needs to be to keep the world economy, the, 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 the climate in, in, the, in the right shape. And uh, let me skip all of this. The fact, the matter of fact is that the electric vehicle sales are skyrocketing. The United States kind of fun is a little bit slower than the other countries, but you know the production of electricity across the planet is also being uh, phased in very, very quickly. So at the end of the day, the issue over here is how do we ensure that these opportunities, the fact that we have developed these new technologies are going to, or how can we ensure that they dominate the challenges? The fact that people don't want to pay for these things or that there is a fight among different countries uh, among uh, uh, about who should pay for it. And economists have a simple and straightforward answer, which is a carbon tax. And there is a classic paper by Mike Golosov and his co-authors that show that a tax on carbon emissions that is proportional to current GDP uh, actually does the trick. Okay, that if you tax carbon at around a ton of carbon issue at around one hundred dollars, we will probably get most of what we will get most of what we need because suddenly, what we will get is that this kick in of renewables in electricity generation and electric vehicles will be so fast that by two thousand thirty five we are pretty much done. But they argue that even with a carbon tax of around twenty five dollars uh, by ton we will make a considerable difference and get very close to where we need to be. And Kotlikov and his co-authors have argued that in fact, we can use this revenue to lower other distortionary taxes and actually get a Pareto improvement. Now, um, what is the problem? The problem over there is voters really, really don't like carbon taxes. Okay? I never quite understood why, but every time we have tried to impose carbon taxes, you know, this is the famous yellow vest uh, opposition in France. Uh, there was a tremendous backlash against it. And the carbon tax was eliminated at the end. I'm not quite sure why voters are so much against it, uh, but happens to be the case that really getting this carbon tax uh, through is very, very difficult. Now, what other type of things uh, we can do? Well, maybe, by the way, I hope you're noticed we are skipping a lot of slides, uh, but you know the, we are sharing the slides with you. So you still have the chance to, to take a look at, at some of the arguments I'm making is um, have a lot of technology subsidies. And the reason why I want to have technology subsidies is because in that way, we can get this as quickly as possible. We can get this as quickly as possible if we can get Okay, this is the graph I wanted to show you. The LCOE of any of uh, things like this is wind, this is solar. If we can really, really get this down as quickly as possible, and remember what I was telling you before of trying to get to the level of 10, which will be around here. Okay, so if we can get to 10, instead of getting to 10 in 2035, we can get to 10 in 2028. Now, so I'm a big fan of those type of technology subsidies. The problem over there is that for these technology subsidies to be um, to be um, uh, really, really efficient, we want them to be technology agnostic. And what I mean by that is that a lot of the technology subsidies we are given these days are tied to particular technologies, to particular choices, okay? And a lot of those do not make a lot of sense. Do not make a lot of sense because governments are not particularly good at figuring it out which are the technologies that are going to be better in the long run. And I'm very worried about the following issue. Well, if we had let nuclear energy develop in the 1970s, we will not be here, okay? Because there was a good chance that nuclear technology had we let it develop without any type of distortions properly in the 1970s, will have become so cheap by the late 1980s 
that we will have decarbonized the world economy without really trying to do so. And in fact, I think that letting the train of nuclear technology pass is one of the largest mistakes that humanity has ever made. But that train is gone, and I don't think there is any political consensus ever to go back to nuclear in the short run. So I, I'm not even going to push for that. But what I'm trying to say is government make decisions about where to spend money on research. And I'm much more in favor of having subsidies that are technology agnostic and don't try to direct technological change in some particular direction. Okay. And this will help us really make a lot of progress in reducing emissions, in mitigation, et cetera, without getting into a lot of cost. And unfortunately, most policies selected by the governments are either too expensive for the results they yield or are even counterproductive. And the IRA, most of the subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States are counterproductive. So let me show you this car over here. This is my Tesla. And the reason I bought a Tesla is because the government is giving me a $7,500 subsidy to do so. There is absolutely no point whatsoever to give me a subsidy to move from an internal combustion engine car to an electric car, uh, to an EV. Uh, this is a complete waste of money uh, from the perspective of the social planner. Of course, from my individual perspective, hey, you are giving me $7,500 for getting a new car, so let's do it. But this is an example of how we are spending way much more than we will need to spend for very little um, outcome. In fact, it's not even clear that a heavy Tesla SUV like the one I got is particularly good for the environment because of the type of consumption involved in the lithium batteries. But you know, let's let's keep this for another for another example. Anyway, let me stop over here about climate change. Uh, most of what I wanted to tell you is yes, I think the uh, scientific evidence is very clear that we need to do something about the climate change. And the good news is that we have the technology already existing or in very short run pipelines to fix this at a very, very reasonable cost. And unfortunately, um, we are not going to do it as quickly and as cheaply as we need it because of policy considerations. And here is an area where I think that economies uh, can contribute. And by the way, no, we don't need to do crazy things like all going vegan or jeopardize monetary policy. Even if the whole United States went vegan, that will be a rounding error in global emissions. So, you know, uh, beyond, I actually think that all those type of uh, virtue signaling is counterproductive. It alienates most voters and those who actually do it are under the wrong impression. They achieve something where they didn't really. And uh, But anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention very, very quickly the two last issues, and then we can stop for some questions and answers. Geopolitical fragmentation. Uh, I have a recent paper where we try to compute an index of geopolitical fragmentation in the world. And what we document is that around 2008, the world is becoming more and more fragmented. This is going to, you know, if this is not reverted, this is going to have very large consequences for the world economy, how this will interact with the demographic changes I was mentioning before, how this is going to change, interact with climate change policies is anybody's guess, uh, but that's a fact. And if I had a little bit more time, I would love to talk more about uh, artificial intelligence. Very, very quickly, I think that artificial intelligence will help a little bit on long-run growth, but it's not going to generate the enormous amounts of growth that people have uh, you know, sometimes venture. I think those uh, those statements actually don't even understand very well how GDP is computed. So it's, you know, a simple example I always put is if we actually have a better medical system that delivers better services at a lower cost, that's great. That increases welfare, but it lowers GDP because the way in which health services are computed in GDP is by their cost of being produced, not by the welfare we get from them. You may argue that that may be a problem with our definition of GDP, but that's fine. That's a different point. Or the fact that artificial intelligence will help us, you know, to become smarter, that's not going to show up in GDP directly. Um, it's going to have effects on the wage distribution. I actually think that uh, for the first time, we are going to have a technology over the last 100 years that is going to help relatively more 
those who are relatively low skilled and those who are relatively more skilled because artificial intelligence is a good substitute of human intelligence and it's going to have important challenges in terms of how we uh, are going to uh, interact with market power and with regulation. I'm not going to say about anything about existential risk before because that goes above my pay grade. But I hope at least these few slides help a little bit on um, give you an idea of how I see the world economy over the last 25, 30 years and how this is going to put a lot of challenges and markets and how a market economy can navigate having a big tsunami, a big demographic tsunami and a transition to net zero. Anyway, let me stop here and see if, if we have questions. Thank you, Jesus. We have a couple of questions. Let's start with the broadest one, which is, what is the role of the markets here? What what roles ma, what role do markets play in ameliorating both climate change and demographic collapse, yeah. especially in terms of the political economy? Do we yeah. need a supranational state to enforce cooperation, for example? Okay, so let me... Uh, no, that's a great question, and that's actually something I was planning to mention in the introduction and then I forgot. So I apologize for that. The reason I think this is interesting is because markets do not work particularly well either for fertility or for climate change. For fertility is obvious because fertility, there is no market for children. And by the way, before anyone goes crazy, and I think it's good, okay, I will not support having a market for children. So the fertility decisions are not something mediated through markets, but mediated through families. And over there, there is no such a thing as a transaction. Now, it is true that things like economic incentives, prices, taxes matter for how many kids people want to have, but it's really a situation where markets do not work quite well. And what we need to think about is what type of tax policies we need to, or uh, government policies we need to set up to control population in the right way. So let me be very open. I don't think we have the perfect answer about what is the optimal population in a society, but I can tell you that a fertility of 0.7 leads a society to collapse. So if I were South Korean, to me, this would be an absolutely existential issue, okay? And, you know, can we get back population fertility to 1.5, 1.6? So at least we have something that resembles a little bit of more sustainable population in the long run. And yeah, that's 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 a role for governments. Now, on this, I don't particularly think that international or supranational governments are necessary because these are decisions that every national government can do on, on its own. With respect to climate change, well, the problem with CO2 emissions is that that's the ultimate externality. You know, Jacob also, I think, went over externalities and explained that an externality is when I do something and it can is impacting someone else and it's not being internalized through the market. And we talk about Ronald Coase and under which situations this could be uh, mediated through the markets. Well, problem is with CO2 emissions, the transaction costs are so high that it's very unlikely to be the case that markets can supply the right answer. Now, Jacob also told you about Picubian taxes. And again, that's something I was planning to say. And then I got a little bit ahead of myself and I forgot. You can really think about this. Oops, what is it? The thing on carbon tax. You can really think about a carbon tax as a Picubian, a Picubian tax. And that fixes externality. What is the problem? The problem over there is that because climate change affects the full earth, we need some type of international agreement. Now, do we need to go to some type of supranational government? I don't think so. I think that in the past, governments have been able to get agreements where everyone cooperated. And those agreements are complicated. They need to provide everyone the right incentives. I only want to highlight that if you want that to happen, whoever needs to pay for it is first and foremost China. And that's the problem. So we are going to convince China to do this. The other day, I was talking about decisions on one say, oh, but the lobbying in the US by the big fuel companies, you know, the oil companies say, look, look, no, that's not it, okay? It's China. The big issue is China. How do we get China to cooperate? How do we get China to dramatically reduce its CO2 emissions? And that's really a situation 
where markets are a little bit of a problem unless we introduce a carbon tax. And if we introduce a carbon tax, we are going to get what we need because we are fixing the market. I uh, more part that less answers the question. Yes, yes. Uh, a more particular question is how many immigrants does America need to make the debt ratio to GDP sustainable and compensate the decline of fertility rates? Okay, so first of all, I'm never quite sure when people ask how many immigrants a country needs. Okay, so I'm going to make two points. Let me go back to that. First of all, okay, I'm talking about the planet. Okay. I'm not talking about the US. So every Mexican that comes from Mexico to the US may help the United States, and I will come back to that point in one second, but will hurt Mexico. Okay? So if you think that immigration is the solution of this, it may be the solution for one country, but it's not the solution for the planet. The wall is already below replacement rate, and so far we don't have immigration from the rest of the universe. Well, I guess that if you watch Men in Black, you may have a different view, but you know, jokes aside. Second, and this is actually a point I have tried to make many, many times. We live in the United States in a welfare state. A welfare state redistributes from rich people to poor people. Okay, so a way to think about it is if you are between zero and 70 in the income distribution, you are a net winner from the welfare state. If you are between 71 and 90, you are more or less neutral. Okay, all these things depend a little bit on, on individual circumstances, but this is a good rule of thumb. Between 91 and 100, you pay. Okay. Every immigrant that comes to the US and falls between zero and 70 is a net loss for the US welfare state. Now, there are many other arguments why we may want to bring immigrants to the United States. Okay, you may say that you care a lot about cultural diversity, that you care a lot about the welfare of the immigrant that comes, that you care a lot about who knows what. And those are perfectly sensible arguments. But if you think you are going to fix the problem of debt sustainability by being immigrants, you are wrong. That's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because we live in a world of the welfare state. This is very different from the 19th century. In the 19th century in the US, there was no welfare state. You will land in Ellis Island, and yeah, there you have it. Now you're in the United States, good luck. This is not the United States of 2024, and even more so in Europe. In Europe, actually, countries like Denmark and the Netherlands have done very, very careful analysis at the micro level and they get that every immigrant that they bring makes their demographic situation worse, not better. So if you think this is about, you are going to fix this with about immigration, you are wrong, sorry to tell you. So how many US, how many immigrants the US needs? I don't know, because that goes again, as I was saying, how much do you value cultural diversity? Well, you may value it more or less than I do, but from a pure technical perspective, does the problem of social security get fixed with immigrants? No. It actually makes it worse. Okay, a related question to that is, if the total fertility rate in the world is declining, to, will this affect global migration patterns? Will Mexicans stay in Mexico? Okay, so actually, I don't know. I have been thinking a lot about that. So I think that there is an argument that says, yes, if, for instance, there is much less... Um, much lower fertility in Mexico or in Brazil, there will be like in some sense less pressure of people to come to the United States. I think there is an argument for that. There is also the counter argument, which is, wow, Brazil really faces a terrible, terrible 
fiscal future because Brazil is going to have the demographics of South Korea or Japan without having the wealth of Japan or South Korea, which may make the fiscal situation in Brazil so unsustainable that will increase the amount of people who want to migrate to the United States. Which of these two forces will predominate? Personally, I think that the first, that there will be less pressure towards migration because there will be fewer people, but I do not fully discount the second one. Okay, one question about the environment is, what do you think about the environmental Kuznets curve? Do you think that independent of political economy pressures, at the end of the day, what creates pollution is the rate of maturity of an economy at China? China will independently reach uh, a stability at some point. They may, they may do that. The problem is that China is so large. So that may be the case. The problem is China is so large and we have go back to the point I want to make. Remember my point over here? Global warming is approximately proportional to the cumulative emissions of CO2, okay? This is all the CO2 we have emitted ever. The problem is China is emitting a, a lot of CO2 in an atmosphere that already has a lot of CO2 that was emitted by United States and Europe in previous decades. I mean, I, I understand the Chinese a little bit on the Indians when they say, wow, you are asking us to um, to reduce our emissions. Well, you know, all this stuff, this is in, in large part also due to the what you emitted in the 1950s. Uh, there is some point to that. But the, the issue is if we let China say, well, there will be a Simon Kuznets curve and China will eventually reduce their emissions in 2050, that may be way too late for the two degrees uh, um, the two degrees target. And you know, the point of Juan Cruz and Rossi Hansberg is this is going to have huge welfare negative consequences. And the interesting thing is the consequences for China are going to be very different than the consequences for Congo. That, that's the problem of emissions. Okay. So imagine that you pollute a river. Okay. So you know, we are Cleveland, 1900, and re the river in Cleveland is very polluted, is basically a local negative externality. The problem with greenhouse emissions is that whatever China is doing is destroying the life of people in Congo. I'm telling the people in Congo, wait until China gets their act together and they reduce their CO2 emissions may not be a good answer to people in Congo. The people in Congo are going to say, why do I need to suffer because of what the Chinese are doing? Okay, uh, one final question. I will try to aggregate a couple of questions that are related in terms of how do all these problems kind of contribute and compose each other in terms of fragmentation, climate change, and yeah. uh, fertility decline? And what are the heterogeneous effects, especially comparing Europe and America? Europe is more challenged than uh, America yeah. would be in that regard. Exactly. So the way I think about it is fragmentation and climate change is very obvious. It's much harder to get everyone on the table to get an international agreement where we trust each other much less. You know, How are we going to get any type of agreement with Putin now uh, in terms of climate emissions? Uh, it's really difficult. So fragmentation makes the transition to a net zero economy much, much harder. Fertility, on one hand, it makes it easier because the world population is growing more slowly, but it also, as I was mentioning before, reduces the fiscal space that governments have because of all these problems I was mentioning before of the sustainability. So governments, uh, imagine again, going back to the case of Brazil, how is Brazil going to handle all the large investments they need to do to decarbonize their economy where they may not be able to pay their pensions, their social security benefits? Um, so Brazil and Latin America is really in a very, very tight spot. As always, in terms of heterogeneity, what I think is going to happen is that countries like the US uh, will more or less find a way through and will adapt to this more or less in a reasonable way. In fact, I think that Japan is, an, is, a, is a wonderful example. I, I always claim that Japan is not an example of doing poorly over the last 25 years. To me, it's the other way around. Japan is a, is a shining example of how to adapt to demographic collapse. And given their, their fertility, they have done really very, very well. So Japan will really probably do quite well. Um, how in the world is Mexico or Brazil going to handle this? You know, just think about Brazil. Brazil has very bad institutions. 
and they are having in front of them terrible demographics, climate change, geopolitical fragmentation, you know, it's kind of hard to be bullish about some of these countries. And Western Europe, yes, is going to do much worse than, than the US. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we've reached the end of the session. Uh, we will have our final plenary lecture by Dirtene McCloskey on Thursday. So the talk will be at 12 at noon, uh, Eastern time. So see you there. Thank you. Okay.